You're about to listen to another inspiring word from House on the Rock Church, the London Lighthouse. For more information and interaction with House on the Rock, please visit our website on hotr.org.uk. Hello, friends. We had a great service this morning. I wasn't the one that brought the message, but one of our pastors, Pastor Ed Betabibi, brought a significant word that you can't afford to miss. So I'm so happy that you are here on our official YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe right away so you know whenever it is we drop something new. And a big thank you to all those of you that have been supporting us. I'm in a rush to get out of your face so that you can be blessed by the message that Pastor Edbert preached this morning. I'll see you after the message. God bless you. Hallelujah. First Peter 2 9. Glory to God. Hill City, God bless you. Uh, extremely apt in. Uh, the song of worship. Every other name needs to fade away. It will make sense as we go along. In 1 Peter 2 9, it says, But you are a chosen race. I'm reading from the Amplified Rendering translation. It said, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, or consecrated nation, a special people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies, the wonderful deeds and virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Father, bless your word in the hearts of your people. I will yield to you fully to do in this service what you have proposed in the mighty name of Jesus. Help me look at your neighbor and say, Empowered Living. Empowered Living, that's the title of my uh, message this morning, Empowered Living. You may be seated. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let me quickly add my voice, you know, to Pastor Timmy's to declare what a wonderful month we had in the month of March. Hallelujah. 31 days of prayer and fasting to seek and to explore the things of God. It was such an awesome time and I believe we all have come into new levels and new dimensions of the economy of God's spirit. Hallelujah. We no doubt will experience impact of the invisible made on the visible. And in this month of empowerment, we will experience God's power on ending power. We will experience the expression of a demonstration of God's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Such a glorious month culminating with the, in the resurrection Sunday that we had last week. A day of celebration of the triumph over death and all things associated with darkness. Hallelujah. We celebrated the triumph of Christ over death, over the spirit of death, and all connected with darkness. It was a glorious day when Jesus defeated principalities and powers, rendered them inoperative, make the public show of them, like the scripture says, triumphing over them. It was a weekend where Jesus offered his life as our substitute, shed his blood as an ultimate prize for you and I, and through death ensured that we can live again for him. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Uh, this is a good place to wave those hands and just thank him because he took your place. Uh, he that knew no sin became sin uh, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, we were not lovable. There was nothing that was exciting about us but he took your place uh, so that now you can live for him. Hallelujah. In Acts chapter 2 verse 23 24 in the amplified translation the bible says but god raised him up liberating him removed the strings of death seeing that it was not 
possible for him to be held back. Hallelujah. God lifted him. Jesus, it was not possible for him to be held back. And Romans chapter 6 verse 4 lets us know that we were buried with him by baptism into death. Like that, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in what? Newness of life. One more time, this is a good place to just bless him and thank him for the new life that he has given unto us because now we are no longer in the grave. Jesus could not be held back, so we could not be held back. He died, we died with him. He resurrected, we resurrected with him unto a new life. Now old things are passed away. All things have become new. Now we live the life of Christ. And the Bible says if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old life has ceased to exist. The life called Adam has ceased. Now the life called Christ Christ has begun. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that you're living the life called Christ? Um, aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Uh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And for you and I, he died. Uh, paid the ultimate price. Uh, not the blood of bulls and goats, uh, but the precious blood of Jesus. Uh, in the Old Testament, we see uh, that there was a situation where a king uh, sacrificed the blood uh, of his first son, uh, and that situation turned in his face favor but when it was but that blood was not sufficient to save you and I but when God wanted to redeem you and I he sent his only begotten son and that blood was shed so that you and I will be let go from the strings of darkness glory to God hallelujah hallelujah blessed be God this morning I would like to share four realities of our new status Four realities of our new status. Hallelujah. Before we go to the communion table. But before then, let me share some insights that came to me differently yesterday. As I received it, I want to deliver it. Hallelujah. Are you still there? You know something, as in God has unique ways of dealing with each and every one of us. And even in this season, I, I hear him say um, he, he wants to walk in ways, walk with us in ways that is unique. He said you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a, a, a special being. And, and God will will walk with you and there will be a uniqueness to it. Hallelujah. It may not make sense to some of us, but uh, I'm sure maybe to a number. So I've noticed that if I'm in the bathroom, God tends, the Holy Ghost tends to speak more often. Also when I'm driving. Unique, different moments. For some other persons, it's different. So I wanted to talk about four things. And yesterday in the shower, this was downloaded in my spirit. And he says, share with them. Are you ready for it? In 1 Corinthians 11, 25 to 26... The Bible says, after the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, and as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Show. KJV um, grammar, spelt S-H-E-W. Now, what does the word show? That word show caught my attention, and, and the more I looked at it, I realized that that word, it's, it's the Greek word katagelo, just put that on one side, <laughs> meaning to declare, 
It means to proclaim. It means to speak of. It means to bring glad tidings. So the word you do show is that as often as you eat it and drink it, and part of that, in fulfilling that scripture of doing it often, we are gathered here today to, at the communion table. He said as often as you do it, what you are doing is that you are showing. And to show means to declare, to proclaim, to speak of, to bring glad tidings. And there was another word that caught my attention when I checked it up. It means to promulgate. Now, what does it mean to promulgate? Simply means, it means to make an idea or belief known to many. Make it known. To make it known to places, to many, to things. Because sometimes we find out that um, places and things are not in tangent with the idea that we hold. All right? Some of you this morning, your account is not in tangent with the idea in your head. Hello? For some other persons, your body right now is speaking a different language. So it's important to be able to declare, to proclaim, to speak of, and to announce, not just to individuals, not just to things and to places, but also to principalities and powers. Are you with me? Now also, promulgation also means the act of making a law or decree known or formally putting into effect by public declaration. So, to promulgate means I am putting into effect a law by public declaration, by publicly declaring it. Are you with me? So you find that centuries ago, even in medieval Europe, it was common to see monarchs uh, promulgate laws and decrees orally by sending messengers to travel throughout the realm to proclaim the king's law. Whenever the messengers appeared dressed in a particular way, the people knew that the king had passed a new law. Are you still with me? And the, procl and the proclamation gave it the force of law. The king had made the law, but he sends messages to go all throughout the realm. And so when they get there, by proclaiming it to say, this law has been made, it gives it the force of law. All right? In modern times, we don't see much of these, but you have now legislatures in whatever system of government, and they have set processes and procedures, all right, through which a law or a bill becomes, gets the force of law. Are you with me? But however... The principle is still the same. In the typical presidential system, it goes from one stage to the other, maybe first reading, second reading, and all that. And then they set up committees, and they will take different um, you know, uh, people come in, and they make presentations. But ultimately, it is passed by a majority. But the president has to give what his assent. He has to sign, all right? And that gives it the force of law. Jesus paid the one-time sacrifice for all. But Paul, by the Spirit of God, is letting us know that whenever we come together as a church, as a church to break bread, it is an opportunity to promulgate, to declare, to proclaim, to give the force of law, the essence and the reason for the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Is somebody following me? That means it is an opportunity to enforce the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus and declare that what has been made legally, what has been made by law, what has been declared by law legally must have vital expression in your life. Are you with me? It has been passed. Jesus has already died. But listen. What he died for needs to be vitally expressed in my life. 
And what is a law? A law is a system of rules between, with which rules which a particular community recognizes as regulating the actions of its members. Are you with me? So when, when we come together like this, we are declaring that the law, only the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, that is the law that will define our existence. That is the law that will hold sway. That is the law that will have control. Is somebody with me? Because there is a law of sin and death. And that law constantly is in contention with the law of spirit and life. Hallelujah. So when we come to break bread, we come to proclaim, we come to give the force of law, that which Jesus died for. He died uh, that you may live. Uh, he died uh, that you will prosper. He died uh, so that depression will not take over you. He died uh, that you will live an empowered life. And so when we gather together, we want to say unto principalities and powers we want to speak to the environment we want to speak to the city we want to speak to our homes speak to our bodies speak to our children hear ye the word of the Lord whatever the word of God says whatever the spirit of life in Christ Jesus declares that is the law that will govern us and nothing else are you with me that's the law Hey, that is the law. Hallelujah. It is also an opportunity to inform all would-be trespassers and offenders to stay clear because the law of the spirit of life has been enacted. Hallelujah. How many of you are ready this Sunday morning to speak to every trespasser and say, you will not trespass my promise. You will not trespass my property. You will not. How many of you know sickness is a trespasser? This body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, not created for sickness. This body was created for the Holy Ghost to dwell in. And so sickness is a trespasser. And so I came today to promulgate and to say, sickness, stay clear. Is somebody with me? Hallelujah. Every trespasser, stay clear. My God. Hallelujah. But do you know something? If you can promulgate which means you can proclaim, you can give the force of law, you can also abrogate. Now, what does abrogation mean? It means to abolish by authoritative action. It means to treat as non-existent. Every force that is not ordained of God We'll stand today, we will abrogate and treat as non-existent. Whatever is not consistent with the life that we were given, whatever is not consistent with the death and the resurrection of Jesus, we will stand as a people and we will declare non-existent. In other words, it will be cleared out of the way. Where depression has set in, we will say, depression, you have no right to stay on this lane, so we address you, clear out of the way. If it's you I'm talking about, somebody shout yes. Hallelujah. 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 You can't afford to be quiet on a day like this. Hallelujah. Stay with me. But I need you to understand that Paul specifically was addressing the church. He was addressing the local assembly. I need you to stay with me here. In 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 18, he says, now, in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together, instead of you coming together for a prophet, you have come together for the worse. Now look at verse 18, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 18. He said, for first of all, when you come together in the church, all right, when you come together in the church, it's important Sometimes, not sometimes, all the times, to look at scriptures in context and understand what Paul or what the scriptures are trying to say. He said, first and foremost, he said, when you come together 
in the church, and he began to say, I hear that there are divisions amongst you, all right? We don't have time to get for that. Also, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty, 20, he says, when you come together, therefore, into one place, is this not to eat the Lord's supper? Now, it, brothers and sisters, it's important you understand the significance and the power that is generated whenever we come together as a church to proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection. Whenever we gather together like this, there is a corporate anointing. There is the release of power. It's a different platform from when you do it as an individual. And I need you to stay with me. The Bible says one will chase a thousand and two will chase ten thousand. All right? You can imagine the kind of power that will be generated with this number here. Authority and power has been given to the local assembly, to the church. And one way to express it is by proclamations and promulgations made when we gather like this to feast at the table. When we gather like this to break the Holy Communion. Hallelujah. To receive or to partake of the Holy Communion. Hallelujah. Because you find the authority figure where Pastor Temi, who stands as the authority figure in the house, he comes and has, he gives direction and instructions. Typically amongst all those authority figures, they come, they create and they speak and they create order, and direction and protection within a household or a church or a community. Hallelujah. There is so much power that is released when we gather like this. Such that you see in the scriptures that when Paul had to chastise the Corinthian church in his letter. He said, don't you understand how you, de- you don't know how to discern the Lord's body? He said, by your actions, you are nullifying, you are making light the, the, the significance and the power that resides in a place like this. Now, to show you the kind of authority and power in the local assembly, in the local body, when we gather like this, when a member in the Corinthian church, decided to misbehave, such misbehavior that you don't even hear amongst unbelievers. Look at what Paul said, how Paul addressed it. In 1 Corinthians 5, 3, he says, For verily, as absent in the body, but present in the spirit, he said, I have already judged the matter, as though I was present. All right? But look at verse 4, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 4. Look at what he says to them. He said, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, when you gather together, and my spirit, of course, is there, and in the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, he said, that guy, deliver him. Let him go and take some strokes. Take some bulala. All right? His body will be dealt with, but for? The salvation. But most importantly, look at it. You see, Paul said, I have judged the matter. But you see, he could have given a sentence from there. He said, no. Give it a stamp of the authority. Because there was power when you gather. He says, when you gather and my spirit is with you, he said, speak and release that sentence. Is somebody with me? Hmm. <clears throat> now, let me quickly throw this in. So we've come today to break bread. And sometimes some make the mistake of being casual about it. But you see, there is so much power that is released on a day like this. So Paul was saying that, listen, because some people are not able to discern the body, he said, that is why some, they are sick. He said, some, they don't take advantage of the power that is released to have a, an advance and, 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 and be able to experience the things of God. Because the local assembly is very important to God. Are you with me? And so on a day like this, we'll come to break bread. And to lift that cup, and he said, this is the New Testament in the blood. It is so significant and powerful. So let me quickly throw this in. 
there will always be online and virtual ministry, which, by the way, existed before COVID. Hallelujah. It is a medium and a channel through which God will use, and God has always used, and will use much more in the end time to reach many. Hallelujah. But there is no substitute for the power and the corporate anointing that is released when brethren gather. I have not found one in the scripture. There is no substitute because there is a measure of authority and power that is released to the local assembly. And so it is important that as a house member, as a member of this house, everyone needs to what? Stay connected. Don't stay far from the body. Sometimes that which you are desiring, you are looking for, it is the answer is in the corporate anointing. So when you are not under that umbrella to receive of it, you know, you stay out of it, then you tarry long in that place. Hallelujah. We've just been through 30 days. So much power was released. I hope everyone came under. I, I, I honestly pray so. <laughs> you understand? Because you still find some. They don't understand. And what I'm trying to get to you, and as instructed, is that there is the unknown thing and the power that is received, that is released in the corporate gradient like this. As I received it, so have I given it to you. Amen. Quickly, four realities to proclaim when we approach the table. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Number one, we are holy. The Bible says that we have a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that we should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Hallelujah. Now, the, the word holy or holiness, I, I realize, has been misconstrued in certain parts of the church. And when people hear the word mentioned, when you say holy, oh, are you holy? Uh, typically, their minds, the minds of individuals are shot, thinking that the preacher once again wants to chastise them, wants to come into their private space. Hallelujah. It's, it's a misconception of what it is. Hallelujah. Because we focus so much on the, uh, the consequence of, of being holy, which is right conduct and proper conduct. Hallelujah. But we neglect to speak to the purpose, which is the why. Why God always wanted us to be holy. Hallelujah. What was God's desire for us? Hallelujah. What does it mean to be holy? It is important to look at the first scripture where that word was used in Exodus chapter 3 verse 5. Hallelujah. It's the law of first mention. And when you go there, it will enable us to gain some perspective understanding as to why God desire or God's desire for us to be holy. Are you with me? Are you still with me? In Exodus 3, 5, it says, Draw not near hither, put off your shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon that stands is a holy ground. That was the first time we find the scripture that the word holy was used. So to be holy was first, oh, so, so you see in that scripture, the word holy was first and foremost ascribed to a place, not even to a human being. It was first ascribed to a place. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So what does it mean to be holy? To be holy means to be sacred. It means to be uncommon. It means to be set apart, consecrated, dedicated. It means to have a hallowed thing. So when we talk about being holy, God is saying, I don't want you to be common. I want to set you apart. I want you to be sacred. <laughs> Hallelujah. The best way I can explain it is, I mean, maybe some of you can identify with that is, I mean, back in the days, my mom used to have a set of drawers where she kept setting utensils, and they're only used on special occasions. You dare not go pick the plates or the cups and use it for regular use. How many of you can identify with that? They are set, uh, okay. 
set apart, <laughs> you know, and so on special occasions, some of those occasions, Easter, Christmas, or you have some special visitors. Oh, and the mommy will open this chest of drawers and bring out some of this stuff, and then after use, they will be washed and what? Kept. And there are some other utensils that are for regular use, and you know where to find them when you are looking for them. <laughs> You cannot miss your way to go to those powers. You will know. <laughs> oh, how many of you understand what I'm talking about? So, so when we talk about being holy, we are talking about we are talking about something that's been set apart for a special use. Set apart for a special use. But very quickly, let's go back to where the word holy was first used. What made that place holy? That was still. That was the mountain that I believe that Moses came with cattle, all right, previously. But on that day, God said, this particular place has become a place that is set apart. It is different. It is uncommon. It is a sacred place. Why? Because the Spirit of God came upon that place. Hallelujah. So when we talk about being holy, we are talking about the intervention of God's Spirit. And all through the Old Testament, we will see types and shadows of places and, and certain places and things that God designated as holy for my special use, for my unique use, for my dedicated use. He said to them in Exodus 19, 6, you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. A time came, he dedicated the children of Israel. He said, you are dedicated to me. You will not be common like others. Now you are holy unto me. Hallelujah. When I was back, I mean, attending high school several years ago, I remember I was reading a Ten Commandments and all that. And I got to that scripture in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. And he said, I, the Lord God, I am a jealous God. And the first thought that came to my mind, I said, jealousy? God, jealousy? Jealousy is what we do. <laughs> jealousy is connected to us. How many of you feel me? Can jealousy be ascribed to God? Ha! Huh. God, you can get jealous? Okay. What I understood much later, why God says he's a jealous God. If you, if, you, if you read the book of Romans, you will see that God said that from the creation of the word, Romans 1.20, from the creation of the word, he said God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature is clearly seen. It is understood by the things that are made. In other words, from the things we can see, we can understand the things that we don't see. Are you with me? From everything. So he says they are without excuse. And I realized that from everything we can see, even us as individuals, as human beings, that God expresses his desire. We see the love of God. We see God's intention to have intimacy with us. And you'll see why the scripture will say that God is a jealous God. Because he's done everything for you. Because he paid the price. All right? And uh, you see, the best way to uh, uh, explain it is a guy and a lady, they got married. All right? Now they're married. The guy has done everything that he needs to do. He's fulfilled all the conditions. And now they're married. It's, it's strange, right, for you to be married and then a week later you find out that either partner has other interested parties who are contending for. Isn't that strange? It is strange. So we see that even in marriage, all right? A marriage, an institution created by God. Everything that God did, he did it to explain to us that my intention is to have unlimited access to you. My intention is to have intimacy with you. My intention, so when we talk about the bridegroom and his bride, you are looking at the bridegroom who has done everything, who in a sense has paid the buy price in a sense, has completed everything. And then now, he says, 
I, I want to have access to you. I don't want you to be common. In other words, I want to be the driving force in your life. I want you to be holy. In other words, I want you to be set apart. So when we talk about one of the realities of redemption is the fact that God has called us to be holy. I want to be the one who calls the short. I want every other name to fade away. I want every other influence to fade away. I want to walk in you both to will and to do of my good pleasure. I want all your lovers to, 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 to take off. Hallelujah. Including money. That is why he said you can't serve God and mammon. Are you with me? So when we talk about the concept of holiness, we are talking about we as the bride, as the church, we dance to the audience of one. Hallelujah. And when you understand that, the right conduct will naturally follow. Because... I mean, there are some people who don't know God, but by just reason of discipline of the flesh, they try to live a moral life. Are you with me? You want to see some of the monks and all that. So, so if holiness is only talks about moral living, then the essence, we don't understand the essence. First and foremost, it is you submitted to God. It is you understanding that you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. It's you understanding that you are peculiar. You are not ordinary. So when we come on a day like this and we take the body and we take the blood, we are reminding him that we are a peculiar treasure unto him. And God is saying, watch and see how I take care of my bride. The one I love, the one I died for. All right? Come and see how I will take care of you. You will, you will wonder how I dot on my bride. How? It's just because you see, some of us, we are chasing what is not found. What is not lost, rather. And God, meanwhile, is chasing us. You see it all replete in scriptures. He said, I came to my vineyard. I tilled it. I planted. I made it ready. And I came to receive and drink of the vine. But now, instead of giving me figs, he's giving me tongues. He said, what will I do about this one that I've done everything for? Are you with me? Tell your neighbor, God is chasing after you. God is chasing after you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He came to redeem us, to be a holy priesthood. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And so the right and the privilege for the highest level of intimacy is granted to the one who has become married to him, who recognizes that he is connected to him. That is why he said, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit with him. Hallelujah. Oh, time will fail me. You see, Paul, in Ephesians chapter 5, started talking about the authority figures and talked about, he said that the husband, he said the man is the head of the woman, and he talked about, he was talking about marriage, and he just went on. He said, no man yet will be beating himself because, you see, you are joined to your wife. He said, for this cause, shall a man leave his father and his mother and be joined unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And he went on and on. He said, by the way, what am I talking about? It's a great mystery, but I speak about Christ and his church. <laughs> he went back. He said, listen, Actually, what I'm talking about is that God wants intimacy with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We'll see all that also in Songs of Solomon. Time will fail me. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God? Your body. And God is saying to one today, as you come to the table, yet again, I want you to submit that body. Submit that soul and submit that spirit and say, God, have your way and see how he will take care of his beloved. Hallelujah. Number two. Hmm. <laughs> oh, the book has been opened. In Luke chapter 14, 16 to 21, oh, Jesus Christ went as was his custom. He went to the temple and it was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. He said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor and has said to heal the brokenhearted and also to set deliverance to the captives. And he went on. He says, the book 
has been opened. By reason of the death and resurrection of Jesus, one reality we need to understand is that now the book has been opened. Jesus Christ opened the book and he found where it was written concerning him. So as we come to the table today, one of the prayers that you can pray is that, Lord, open the eyes of my understanding. Because listen, there is nothing you are experiencing right now that the solution is not captured in the book. And that book has been opened and we need to pray for open eyes. Open eyes, open gates. Lord, open the eyes of our understanding. He said, call upon me and I will show you great and mighty things that you know not. Hallelujah. So we see in Revelation chapter 5, and they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof. He said, For thou wast slain and has redeemed us unto God by the blood out of every kindred, out of every tongue, out of every people, and out of every nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we will reign on the earth. Jesus was worthy to open the book, to open the seal. Now we can go through the word of God. Now we can behold that word. Now notwithstanding whatever is happening, you can Take a look at it, my God, and receive that which is yours in the mighty name of Jesus. Did, I mean, did you realize that in Numbers, when the children of Israel were being beaten by serpents because they had disobeyed God, and Moses, God told Moses, he said, create the brazen serpent and put it on a pole. He said, everyone that looks at it, did you understand, did you realize that God did not take away the serpent? The serpent was still there, but he said, I want you to focus, just focus, focus on the brazen serpent. Because why? Focus, because listen, the book, the book is now in force. Just go ahead and continually look at the word, study that word, open your hearts to the word, and it doesn't matter what's happening around you. You will receive your miracle. You will receive your healing. Hallelujah. And so the Bible says, we all with open face, uh, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Uh, we are turned, we are changed uh, into the same image uh, from glory unto glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Uh, and number three, I will end here. Access has been granted. Uh, access by the Spirit has been granted. In 2 Corinthians 3.17, the Bible says, Now the Lord is that Spirit. Now what is the Lord? He said, Now the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. That Lord was the Jesus in person who was with them, going with them in the, in, in the, in the gospel. He was with them, walking with them. When they needed food, he provided food. When the the son died, Jesus Christ was there and he was he came back to life whatever they needed he provided and Jesus Christ said I am going to go but the comforter will come I will come back in the person of the comforter and we are told, he says now the Lord is that spirit and the exciting thing is that wherever the spirit of the Lord is there is what, there is liberty, there is freedom in other words, no limit he will quicken you by his spirit. When they say there is a casting down, when they say you can't go beyond this level, he will say watch and see what my spirit will do. He says I will shake the nations. I will shake the eternal and I will bring about my purpose. Now the Lord is that spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is access. There is liberty. There is transformation. Hallelujah. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. So now we are kings. Now we are priests. Now we raise the altar before God. Now we can come to the table and we can release and declare and promulgate and abrogate and declare. If the word of God says it, this is what we will declare. We understand that there was power in the corporate gathering. There was power in the communion. Uh, 
And so when we come, we are not quiet about it. We are not kings who rule. They issue decrees by the words that they speak. So how many of you under the sound of my voice, you are not going to be quiet this morning. You understand that there is power in your word. There is power in your mouth. There is power in the communion. There is power in the corporate anointing. And you will not let that situation to continue go unattended. Who am I talking to this morning? Who is ready to change all to things? The Bible says you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You will be my disciples in Jerusalem. You will come to Tufnell Park and you will say, I will not live here until I have addressed that situation. And because there was power in our corporate gathering, things are about to change. If it's you I'm talking about, lift up your voice and shout a big amen. Wow, what a wonderful way to start the month. We are empowered to live the way God always intended for us to live in this month of empowerment. I trust that you were blessed by that message. I want to encourage you to support us in that which we do. The various ways in which you can give are now showing on the screen. Please choose the pathway that's most preferred by you. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, what are you waiting for? Subscribe right away and turn the notifications on so you know whenever it is that we are live or when we've dropped something new on the platform. Looking forward to seeing you again real soon. God bless you. We hope you've enjoyed this uplifting sermon from House on the Rock Church, the London Lighthouse. We hope you've been informed and inspired. Join us for services every Wednesday and Sunday. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at HOTR London. Also, live stream our services on YouTube at HOTR London. For more information, visit our website on HOTR.org.uk.